welcome back to uh, the Bafamundo Show. It is uh, our privilege this evening to be able to carry on a dialogue with uh, a gentleman who has been and who continues to be a pioneer in the music field, Mr. Robert Fripp. Good evening. <laughs> Mr. Fripp, it's a pleasure <laughs> having you here. Thank you. For those of you at home, uh, very restfully seated at 8 o'clock this Saturday evening, no, for us it's 11.15 on Friday morning. That's right. Wake up. Yes. And we're off. Okay, I'd like to start the questioning. Um, in 1970, you remarked once that, quote, King Crimson is a way of life, it's a very intense thing, unquote. Four years later, when Crimson ceased to exist, you stated, quote, the energies involved in the particular lifestyle of the band and in the music are no longer of value to the way I live. Uh, are, you involved, are you evolving in the direction that you anticipated in 1974? I didn't have anticipations. I didn't really have expectations. I had no idea what I would do. Hmm. Other than, uh, and at this moment, I lean forward and look into this camera <laughs> intimately, presuming it to be upon me, although there aren't little lights yeah, flashing. <laughs> Good evening, all you folks out there in Radio Land. <laughs> uh, I left King Crimson for a number of reasons. Um, one way of, of putting that forward would be to say that it was no longer an appropriate form of education, that all the, all the questions which were beginning to arise in that FRIP were not being, were not meeting a response in the rock and roll world, in the same way that when I'd been selling houses for my father, trainee real estate, mm -hmm. uh, in Wimborne in Dorset, the questions which were then coming up in that FRIP weren't being answered by that particular situation. So I went from there to music, and then obviously I, I left music and went on to something else which I thought would be an appropriate form of education. This was the International Academy for Continuous Education at Sherbourne House in Gloucestershire, which took me about a year to wind up my affairs to go there, about a year there and about a year recovering. Uh, so the question is, am I now what I anticipated that I might be, having gone to that. Yes and no, that I had no expectations, but I wished to find some practical way of dealing with this idea of being a small mobile intelligent unit. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm doing now would seem to be a more accurate reflection of that notion than what I was doing formerly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you simply <coughs> change. You, you just want to have the freedom to go wherever you feel the questions that arise in this FRIP can be answered. If no, it be I, don't, I, I don't wish music. the freedom in that sense. I wish to have, from one point of view, absolutely no choice. So what is, is obvious uh, mm -hmm. presents itself to me. Right. Uh, in a sense, having committed myself to this drive to 1981, for you, for those of you at home, you, s you find some scant, scant reference to this on <laughs> this poster. Uh, this drive to 1981 commits me for two and a half years to be working substantially in the marketplace in positions of public access and accessibility. And having made that decision, I don't really have to worry too much about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the details will be filled in as, as, as the drive continues and so on. But rather than sitting, sitting around wondering, is this the life for me? Should I be doing better things? And so on. <coughs> All my energies can simply go into this particular campaign. I think the analogy here would be, uh, th there's a little story of a Sufi master who says, choice, choice, freedom. I have no choice. I can only do the will of God. This is freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> from one point of view, uh, I would view this drive to 1981 as being a personal discipline. But from a practical point of view, having determined to do it, it, it saves me an awful lot of energy, wondering, should I be doing other things? Yeah. Is this mm -hmm. the right thing sure. to do? Yeah. All, so. the, all the self-doubt is... Now, one, th one thing I found about being interviewed, the people that come along with <laughs> extensive notes and research, uh, as soon as final draft, Robert Fripp interview, if you know exactly the questions you're going to ask, this implies that you know what my answers will be. Not at all. No. 
Uh, we outline, no, we outline what we're not. curious about, right. and we boil it down, right. and wherever the conversation goes... Chances are we it. won't cover most of this. Uh, it's just if the opportunity should arise, I should be prepared. All right. Um, so we go to number two? All right, let's move on. If you don't mind delving into the past no. for a couple of minutes, personally, uh, myself, and I'm sure the Bafamundo audience would be curious about certain past Crimson members, mm -hmm. uh, some of which we have never heard of since. Mm -hmm. We know what's happened to Bill Bruford and John Wetton. There are certain people, such as Ian Wallace, Gordon Haskell, the Giles brothers, uh, David Cross, Jamie Muir. We haven't All heard right, let's, anything let's from them. Let's go from the beginning. Michael Jones left King Crimson uh, to get married, and uh, that's essentially what he is. He's married with a, a son, living three miles down the road from Wimborne mm -hmm. in Dorset. Uh, Isn't he, that music anymore? He, in the sense that Michael Giles, excuse me, as uh, one would say in England, is Michael Giles. Uh, he has done some sessions, but in terms of what Mike can really do, no, I don't think he's done very much since he left. <coughs> uh, Ian McDonald, obviously with Foreigner, Greg Lake was with Emerson Lake and Palmer. He also lives just three or four miles down the road from Wimborne. Mm -hmm. Peter Giles is a solicitor's clerk, has been outside of music for nine years, ten years. Hmm. Uh, then Mel Collins uh, played saxophone on the Rolling Stones, Some Girls. Ian Wallace... Camel. Uh, mm -hmm. Camel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does other sessions. Ian Wallace was Bob Dylan's drummer. Ah. Boz Barrel with Bad Company. Mm -hmm. Right. David Cross... Uh, Figured out. Hmm. <laughs> David Cross bought a bicycle and cycled across Southern Ireland with his violin. I've not seen of him, seen or heard of him since. And uh, there's a there's a story there. When it was determined that, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, David would have to leave the band, I said, "I'm going to tell David." This was the very last gig in America, very last King Crimson gig, actually, July the first, 1974. And I said, "I shall tell David." And they said, "No, no, no, you can't tell David. He'd jump out the window." Uh, I don't think that's true, but uh, there was some genuine concern that his distress might result in an unfortunate situation. So I said, well, look, I'm prepared not to tell him, provided that you do, immediately he gets back to England, because I was going to stay in America for another week. Mm -hmm. So I returned to England to find that he had not been told, and he was only told the day before the Red Sessions began. And rightfully, rightfully, I think he was probably outraged at his shabby treatment and seemingly off-hand way in which he was dismissed. So although I've made several overtures, overtures to David since uh, to continue our friendship, because of all the people I worked with in Crimson, David was the closest to a really close personal friend that I had. Hmm. Uh, Jamie Muir is a monk in... A <sighs> A monastery on the border of Tibet. He left King Crimson to become a monk and remains so. And John with UK and Bill with Bruford. Bill there with Bruford. There you have it. There you have it. Okay, and we're off. Um, I'd like to speak of someone else who's had a profound influence on you, uh, speaking primarily of uh, Brian Eno. Uh, we wanted to know if um, you use his method of oblique strategies in your work or in your everyday life. Now, I have my own way of working with Hazard. Eno would describe uh, this probably as random, random elements. Mm -hmm. I would use Bennett's idea of Hazard, which is dis defined as chance and significance combined, that a random event may or may not have significance. A hazardous event always will. So uh, Brian's particular way of dealing with random situations, if you like, is to produce an oblique strategy. I have a different way of dealing. And if a choice is finally needed, I'll toss a coin. Really? Hmm. Well, would you like to go more into depth as to your uh, concept of, of hazard? I'm slightly... All right. Um, the 19th century had this uh, fairly optimistic view that the universe was mechanistic. If Well, that wouldn't be optimistic, but that one could accurately predict any outcome. Uh, the 20th century, having seen a number of situations happening which couldn't be predicted, have revised the situation that, yes, we can predict accurately that maybe one random situation will occur in 10,000. 
whereas the 19th century would have said it will be the 998th. We can predict this. The 20th century would say, we can accurately predict that it'll be 1 8 of 10,000, but we don't know which one. Mm -hmm. This is the hazardous factor. Uh, so if one accepts this as a, as a universal situation, uh, one could say that there is nothing guaranteed in the whole universe. Bennett expressed this as the idea of the dramatic universe. Mm -hmm. Another way of expressing it <coughs> would be the way I express it, the law of discontinuity of straight lines. Nothing moves from A to B in a straight line. Something always changes, always deflects. So this is a slightly less sophisticated version of Gurdjieff's Law of Seven, or a bit more sophisticated version of Murphy's Law, that if it can go wrong, it will. Well. <laughs> now, I don't know quite how far to, to go into this. If one accepts the idea that in any situation, it's not likely, if the situation is genuinely creative, it's not likely that one can accurately predict the outcome, which is a mechanistic situation. If the situation is mechanistic, it is ex therefore somewhat explicitly not capable of change and not cap capable of creative input. Mm -hmm. So things can go wrong. We find ourselves in a world situation where things are frequently going wrong. And we might throw our hands up in the air, like so, and say, but we're nice people, we're not creepy. Why should the world be in such a dreadful situation? Why doesn't God put it right? Where are these angels descending from the heavens, blowing trumpets and working hard to repair our environment and so on? Uh, this, this notion of the uh, reciprocal maintenance, reciprocal eating, that everything is inter interlocked and interwoven. John Don expressed this as ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for you and me and me and so on. If one does accept this as more than an idea, and having worked on it to a degree, particularly through the Sherborne experience, that there does seem to be something more involved in it than just a bright theory. There's hope. There's hope that a qualitative act, on however small our particular widows might, might be, that since qualitative situations are not bound by quantitative rules, a small act of quality by you or me, or you, or you, our cameraman, <laughs> is as large a qualitative act as a large act, mm -hmm. since uh, quantity and quality is two s separate instances. And that if one can in some small way bring a, a, a qualitative situation into one's life, it does affect others. My personal expression of this is that a qualitative leap inwards, it spans outwards in all directions. So this gives us hope. In other words, where, where are these angels to put, put the world right? Here we are. Here you are. Mm -hmm. This is it. The good news is I sense that there is an action in the world. The bad news is it's up to us. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Along, yeah, go ahead. There is uh, a recurring statement on the title track of your uh, exposure album, quote, it is impossible to achieve the aim without suffering. Yes. Could you elaborate a little on that? Does that have something Certainly. to do with uh, what all you're speaking of? All this at 11.28 in the morning. Yeah. It's um, too heavy for me. All right. Uh, <laughs> but bear in mind on Saturday evening at home with a jolly and, and feeling relaxed with one's feet, feet up. People uh, will sit back and And mellow and out. Or, mm. All right. Mm. It is impossible to achieve the aim without suffering. Right as well as several other statements that seem to be by the same man. Yes, let's concentrate on this one for now. The statement is actually taken from the first inaugural address to Sherborne, Ho Sherborne House mm -hmm. in October 1971. Uh, it is impossible to achieve the aim without suffering. All right, if one is moving from Los Angeles to San Francisco, but one believes that one is in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. 
one's route is likely to be confusing to say the least. Least. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a remarkably good chance that one might never get to San Francisco. So first of all, one has to be aware of the situation in which one is. To have a direct glimpse of that situation is quite terrifying. Uh, when I'd been at Sherborne House for some two months, I was down by the woodwork shop. And In, in a flash, the insight or whatever lasted about half a second, and I simply saw that Robert Fripp didn't exist. And it wasn't a question of uh, pulling out my tomes on esoteric psychology, cosmology, <laughs> lectures 28. I simply saw that, that there is nothing there. It, nothing there. But there was something, but it, it wasn't Robert Fripp. It, Robert Fripp simply wasn't there. It was just an arbitrary construct. It's quite terrifying simply to, to know that one doesn't exist. So I would say that was uh, a situation of exposure. Aha. Uh -huh. And it was terrifying. So it's impossible to achieve the aim until, unless you see where you are. And it's painful. Fortunately, uh, although I remember the situation and, and because of it I have a different relationship with whatever I might be. The terror of, of just seeing that in a flash doesn't live with me. I think it's very considerable grace that we have fictions by which to live. That I know they're fictions. We know they're fictions. Yeah. But anyway, the other particular <laughs> side of, of that, this notion of suffering, that some suffering is necessary. Uh, it's inevitable, but a lot of suffering isn't. Um, for example, I tend to be a little greedy, and I suffer dreadfully for that. But it's not necessary. So if I can somehow manage to give up my greedy impulses, there's an awful lot of suffering, unnecessary suffering, which I don't have to bother with, leaving me the energy to get on with the necessary kind of suffering. Mm -hmm. now, if you've ever tried to do someone a good turn without in any way expecting something for yourself in terms of hidden agenda and so on. It's interesting to note that one never gets thanked if someone comes to you, up to you on the street and say, have you got a quarter? And you say, oh, here's a quarter. Only a quarter? Come on, you got a w you're well healed, give me a buck. <laughs> and so it goes on. Uh, but if one is genuinely trying to work with this idea of, uh, well, it's just trying to commit oneself to, to a sense of appropriate behavior, decent behavior, behavior, however one expresses it for oneself. There is this irony that you'll always get a kick up the backside. But if your commitment is uh, a real one, you, you'll try and keep going with it. Mm -hmm. it you know, this is the idea of conscious labor and intentional suffering that you know you're going to get kicked up the backside, and you really don't want to, but you're going to have to do it anyway. But you're at least prepared for it, if you, if, if you well, know there's it. A, there's a different sense of dealing with the situation. Now, anyone who's got anywhere near um, the notion of public service, no one would campaign to be elected for public service if they were genuinely interested in public service. It's a very considerable responsibility, for which only one is only really spat upon. Right. Uh, for me, this drive to 1981 and coming out into the marketplace is a discipline. I'm a, a somewhat private person who considerably enjoys the company of people. But nevertheless, I have, I, I have a need for my own privacy. And I don't get it in this situation. But uh, it's more than compensated for a number of reasons. One is sense that uh, I meet a lot of remarkably good people who more than outweigh the odd proportions of the, the person who's come along to, as Peter Hamill would express it, uh, be an energy vampire. There are some ways of, <coughs> of looking at people. 
like this, the, the young enthusiast at my feet who is stealing everything I have with his eyes. I mm -hmm. said to one man two nights ago, um, there are ways of looking, but staring only takes. And he modified the way he was using his eyes. Mm -hmm. And last night I could sense, um, and I can't demonstrate this empirically, but my, sense, my sensitivity to crowd responses is fairly acute, if only because of some three and a half months of doing this, three months of doing this, that I, could, I can tell when there is concentration and intention and when there isn't, and last night th there wasn't. Mm. That if one has a balloon of air, one only needs one hog in it, and it, it goes. Right. There was a gentleman there with a cassette machine, mm. specifically after the, the ticket said no cassette machines, specifically after I asked people not to turn them on, he turned it on and felt no responsibility whatsoever for his action. I found that so intrusive that even if one didn't agree with my presentation, purely as an act of human courtesy, one would not have turned on the cassette machine in that situation, mm. and yet he did. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me ask you something <coughs> regarding the difficulty you had, and I could see you would have, in dealing with the audience, the people who went to see you last night. On one hand, you asked the audience to actively to listen, listen to what you were doing, to share yeah. in, in what you were trying to do, your art. And on the other I hand... I don't like that word, art. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, that's well. a different question as well. In, I, in a sense, I would prefer craft. I think craft is something, if one sees art as that breeze which bloweth as it listeth, that intangible quality, that certain something, you know, the magic of a performance, we can't control that. But we can raise a sail to catch the breeze. So the craft would be the disciplines one undertakes, in this case as a musician, mm -hmm. in order to try and get <coughs> near that. Yeah. But that's just an aside. Well, yeah, well, my point was that um, a lot of people stopped by to see your virtuosity, to uh, your, uh, your disappointment. Um, they came to see your craft, your playing. My question is, how do you make a definition of art from craft? Or, or as you just kind of stated, mm. it's all sort of one vehicle. They go hand in hand. All right. Art is, is where you wish to go. Craft is how you get there. Mm -hmm. uh, the art, one, the number of different ways of approaching this. I mean, art is a, a leveled experience, which uh, works on a number of different levels simultaneously. It's in a sense a mirror of uh, an individual person or a society or whatever. Um, a commercial situation is something which exists only on one level. But. My concern is always to talk, is always to touch that, that intangible something, which is, uh, it's the difference between really making love and wanking, that it's a com entirely, entirely different quality experience, entirely, entirely different taste, which if one has tasted is so sublime that I know of musicians who have spent five or seven years in dreadful situations, poverty, abuse, and so on, just to recapture that sense of, of something. Uh, I, I, I would work for another seven years just to get near some of the experiences I've had this tour. It's remarkable, quite remarkable. But you can't pin it down. You can never guarantee it. You can only, perhaps, um, create c conditions in which it's more likely. And I mm -hmm. made one or two suggestions about how that was possible last night. And there was not, um, it was not possible with last night's audience. There could be, perhaps, some good music and some interaction. But there was not a possibility last night for something a bit more special. Well. On behalf of Ron and myself, we... No, I, no, 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 we're not closing up here. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say that uh, it reached us, and mm. we enjoyed it, in spite of the fact was, that there were the distracting groans and noises, and yeah. if we were armed, there might have been bloodshed, but... Uh, <laughs> you see, this is, 
this is the thing. I, I'm saying, why don't why don't you go and play Santa Monica and all the rest of it in the Civic? And uh, why don't you play in a theatre where two thousand people come? Or we know a nice theatre; it holds only eleven hundred people. And my response is that some relationships are governed by size. Now, it will be irresponsible of me to go into a situation of maybe two, three thousand people, even a thousand people, who have different expectations. Excuse me. <coughs> who have different expectations, do not have the training to listen attentively, and anticipate entertainment. This is the idea of spectator sport, passivity, and so on. And if someone wants to go along, roll a spliff and get blottoed, they are not going to be in sufficient control of their powers of attention in order to contribute. So the person last night who shouted out, can I smoke a joint? Yes. The answer is, this is not a situation in which that's appropriate. So I'm as far as possible making uh, making this evident so anyone who simply wants to come along and give up their responsibility in terms of their ears and being a human being in this Frippertronics performing context will be advised that there are better things for them to do. And mm -hmm. I don't say that in an offhand or callous way, but this is not the context for entertainment. Right, exactly. It's an opportunity for someone to, uh, to reach out and share, and that's what I look forward to doing. As, uh, as far as sharing your, your expertise and your knowledge with other people, has your production work with uh, Peter Gabriel, The Roaches, Daryl Hall, has that been a satisfying experience? Do you enjoy producing other people's material as opposed to working out your own craft? Um, I prefer work to craft or art or whatever for me. Okay. All right. Um, people at home that, that listening to us talk and so on might think that I'm a serious person and that my work is not to be enjoyed. It's very serious. It's, um, it's not serious at all. So in terms of do I, uh, have I enjoyed production? Yes, I've had some really enjoyable experiences with Daryl Hall. Daryl Hall's unreleased solo Is it ever going to come out? There are so many contradictory quotes on this. Uh, Let's clear the record. All right. Quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, quickly. Cynthia 30 from, seconds. Cynthia from Daily Variety phoned up RCA, the Vice President of Business Affairs, and he said, we are happy to release this record whenever Daryl wishes. Yeah. My understanding is that Daryl wished to release it nearly two years ago. Right. It was the record was completed on November the second, nineteen seventy-seven. Uh, there have been a number of other quotes from RCA. One of them was that we are not delaying the record. We are waiting. We are negotiating convenient release date. Ex excuse me. We're going to continue to talk. We hate to interrupt. Uh, ah. Mr. Fripp, but we are out of time. Oh. Do tune in oh. to the Bakamundo show in a couple of weeks, and uh, it's been an exciting evening. Everyone go have a drink of water or something, relax right. a little we bit. We thank Robert Fripp for oh, yes. thank you. on the show. Thank you. Mr. Fripp, pleasure. Gentlemen, thank you. And good night from the Bakamundo gang. A, have a good evening. Yeah. Okay, so go on. Because no, right. we, we heard of